Today, we're at Wimbledon Town Football Club to record and evolve to succeed podcast with Jimmy Glass. Jimmy Glass is notorious for that goal in 1999 that kept Carlisle in the Football League. He had a career as a goalkeeper, making over 160 professional appearances. But what I wanted to talk to Jimmy about was not that football career, although clearly we've touched on it during the course of the conversation, but more about what life has been like for him since, how he's changed his life, how he's endeavoured uh, to forge a career outside of football, only for football to drag him back in. We hear all about that, his experiences with Eddie Howe, and also now his life at Wimbledon Town Football Club. Jimmy is an open and honest individual and character, and therefore there's lots of value in this conversation for all of us that lead and own businesses. Welcome, Jimmy, to the Evolve to Succeed podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, Going to have a conversation today about your life as a professional footballer, but mo- more importantly, perhaps to our listeners, things that have happened to you in your life since and the lessons that you've learned along the way. But you know, for our listeners, we should probably put in context your professional career. So tell us a little bit about your career as a professional goalkeeper, Jimmy. See, that's an interesting one because I, you know, I was a, from the moment I left school at 15 to Probably for 13 years, I was involved professionally with, with the game. Um, started at Crystal Palace as a YTS apprentice um, back in, nine, what was it, 1989. Palace at the t- time were actually quite a good team. They're just yeah, they're riding just, high at the time, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, uh, righty, uh, right and bright. Steve Couples, the manager, they were you know, doing really well. So I immediately went into a successful environment. Now, when I mean successful, they weren't obviously Man United, but they'd gone from what would now be the championship into what is now the Premier League. So from the old second division to the first division. So the, the, the club was on a high. Football was very different back then. The facilities were very different. The, the coaching was very... Everything was very different about football back in the late 80s, early 90s. It was obviously the invention of Premier League which mm. and, and then the, the sky money which really created yeah. football as you, as you know it today. But even still, very competitive environment. Uh, you had to be strong mentally probably was a greater asset to be strong mentally than probably technically proficient in those days. And that's just because of the nature of the game and the way you were managed and... Yeah, exactly. And the characters in the game. Mm. And this is pre probably the, the European um, world influx of players. Yeah. So this is old English type it's old football. school British old school, football, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I, so I grew up in a, a palace. We had a, a real strong... Um, mentality team we then had an influx of ex crazy gang Wimbledon players coming okay. into the dressing room that would have made room. a difference we did yeah <laughs> because anyone knows the Wimbledon the old Wimbledon story you know it was a really interesting story mm. and a very small Southern League club that, yeah. that went all the way to the top probably the, the ultimate was winning the FA Cup final in 88 but they did that in a way that was different to other teams and so the likes of Eric Young came into the dressing room Andy Thorne um Mark Dennis at left, yeah, real characters, big characters that grew up in that crazy gang environment. So it was kind of a baptism of fire. Yeah. And um, how did you survive in that environment as a, what, 17, 18 year old? Well, I, ultimately, I was 15 at the time when I left school. And then, do you know, in truth, I, and this is the crux of my career, I, I, I didn't, I don't think I really made the most of my ability. Mm. That sounds a bit sort of big headed, but, but, you know, my ability was greater than my success as a goalkeeper. Yeah. I think the truth of the matter was my, and what we would call mental health nowadays, yeah. and my self-belief and self-confidence wasn't um, what I showed it to be. I had to create a bit of a character. Yeah. I'm quite a sensitive character at heart, and I had to create a character to, to be able to compete and survive in that environment. And I've, I've heard you say this, and it was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, was that you talk about, you know, as an individual, we all see you if we've been to the hospitality or now at Wimborne Town. Or, you know, you've, your character, you're full of confidence as an individual. But you always say that confidence never served you on the, was never there or never felt like it was there on a the football pitch. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a difference between knowing you can do something mm. and being confident. Yeah. You know, I think, I think as a young man, I, I just didn't understand myself at all and didn't understand what, what psychology yeah. was I had no idea and, that, and the game at that stage didn't have those characters in it to help you establish well, that do you know what I never had a, in, the, in the 13 years as a, as a professional goalkeeper I had about 18 months of goalkeeping training 
that's that's the stand, and that's training. We're not even talking about coaching. We're not talking about what you get wow. nowadays. I'm talking about someone just take having having enough balls to throw them to you and give you a workout. You know, the the game was very backward by mm-hmm. today's standards, and I think I played on natural ability pretty much all of my career, just natural ability, which took me to a level and to mm-hmm. a point. I think my point was championship, took me to that kind of level yeah. in modern day standards. And then the pressures of being a, a, a goalkeeper within a tough industry yeah. started, to, started to kind of show and, and the cracks started to appear in my, in my, in my psychology, in my mindset. Yeah. And that's when my career started to, started to go, go downwards. Um, and it took me a long time to sit and reflect on that, mm. you know, when I stepped away from football. Um, and we'll talk about that in we a will, bit. We will, definitely. Uh, but it took me a long time to understand that, uh, that when I was younger, I needed the support and the, the, someone to help me develop my mindset mm. to give me that confidence. Yeah. Um, but that's, again, th- that could be said of many footballers, I'm sure. And it's, it's crazy, really, for me, and I'm sure at some point we'll talk about a certain goal, but it's crazy for me really to look back at my career and think, well, actually, I, f- I feel like I failed, mm-hmm. you know. And but I do. The truth of the matter is, I, I didn't make the most of. And, of, and that's of my not because you feel like that sense of failure is that you don't feel you fulfilled your potential. Yeah, definitely, that's definitely. The, I don't, I don't sit back and regret it. it now. But no. I know I didn't fulfill my potential, and I think that's that, that's probably the same for many people, and not just in football, in life, in business, mm-hmm. in whatever. You know, definitely. you can you can you can look back and reflect and think, well, did I make the most of myself? Yeah. And, and why didn't I? And it is quite interesting. Like you say, in business and in life, quite a few people get out of the starting blocks quite quickly, don't they? And then start to kind of plateau and then... And well, well, if, well, football, I'm going to use football as, a, as an example. In those days, you know, there was strength of character, but then it was a more open game and, 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 and ability as well. And, and I think the modern footballer is a very different animal. Mm. The modern footballer doesn't get anywhere near... With the, the very few exceptions, doesn't get anywhere near the top flight if they haven't secured their mentality, if they haven't yeah. been able to um, condition themselves mentally to be able to take what it is they're trying to do. The, the, the mindset of being a footballer nowadays is very different. It's, you've got to be strong mentally and you've got to be professional, for, for want of a better yeah. word, from a very early age. Yeah. Whereas when I, when I was young and the football I played in, that wasn't the case. We can obviously talk about Wimbledon Town, but it's probably a good reflection point to think about. Does that now, those experiences reflect into how you're, you know, you're the general manager, you're not the football manager of the club. Um, but does that reflect in how perhaps you want to see the club, you know, react and deal with its own kind of trainees and academy players? It's very much so. Um, and even t- to give you an example... You know, our, we've got a young academy here in terms of it's only been going a couple of years and, and, and they've been struggling a little bit with their football, the football side of it. Um, and I, I actually took it upon myself on Saturday to go onto the pitch before their game. I was, I, I was in my wellies trying to, trying to sponge the main pitch to get our game against <laughs> Melbourne. It's a glamorous life. You leave it was, now, yeah. <laughs> but I, I knew I'd moved them from Blanford where they were playing their home games, uh, which is another story what, um, altogether. But they had a game on Saturday morning on the 3G. Now, now our academy ha- hasn't been having great results and I've been watching them thinking well, well it's not a footballing thing so it must be a mindset thing mm. so w- what I've learned over the years and I'll, I'll be honest I've probably learned more about life sat in my taxi for 13 years than yeah. I ever did as a footballer or, or probably since what I've learned is you control that side of yourself you can manage your mindset you know there are elements of life and, and sport you cannot control you yeah. can do your best to prepare yourself to overcome adversity or, or wh- whatever it is you're trying to achieve. But, but your mindset is something you actually control. And, and I, I pulled the lads on, on Saturday morning and I, and I thought, that, well, that's the difference. That's the difference. That's what's lacking. Yeah, that's what's lacking. I'm not, I, I told you, you might not win this game today. They were playing Hamworthy, actually. And I, that was a, irrelevant. It wasn't like it was a local derby or I thought that. I said, you might not win this game today, but there are elements of this game you can control. And, and that's something that I've heard people say now over the years, and especially the eight years I had at AFC Bournemouth, yeah. because that was a very different world. Yeah. Uh, the world that Eddie Howe created and the world I went back to work in. Yeah. And the truth of the matter was I, I was a long way out of football and probably never thought I'd get back into yeah. football, but watching what Ed was, was creating and the way he was doing it inspired me to know that actually you back. well it's being done the right way now yeah and 
And that's so, in terms of Wimborne Town, the reason I took this job, there are a few varied reasons I took this job, but one of them was that, I suppose, the autonomy of, of being able to install now my understanding of what gives you success. Mm. And there are elements that you control. Yeah. There are elements that, that you can actually, and what you find is, and the crazy thing is, is you find if you control the elements you can control, you'll find the success is just around the corner because the, the, the little yeah. bits aren't actually that difficult to then overcome. Yeah. Well, it's such a, yeah, it, because it does that mindset piece, that doing what you can do, being the best version of yourself when you show up every day, that probably is 80% of the job, isn't it? Well, the reality is now, and <clears throat> and this is, again, I'd, I'd always say, it's, it's, it's everything in life. It doesn't matter whether you're a footballer, you're working in Tesco's. Mm. It doesn't matter what you want to do with your life. If you become the, or try to become, do you know what? It, it goes into relationships. Yeah. It, it goes, it, it's, it's how you become a parent. If you, if you try to, no, not try. We don't want to sound like Yoda. You either do or do not. There is no try. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you manage your mindset to be the best version of yourself and you're going to, of course you're going to have down, do, down days and you're not going to be able to do it all the time. But you keep going with that, with that mindset and that goal. And if you become the best version of yourself, um, you will be successful. Yeah. And, and when we talk about success, we're not talking about whatever your, yeah. whatever it is, whether it's money you want, whether it's friends you want, whether yeah. it's just peace of mind, um, whether it's physical um, strength and conditioning, yeah. and wh whether it's the greatest marriage in the world, you know, you, you do get to, you do get to choose. Yeah, so it plays a part though, doesn't it? Well, it does, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. And probably did it with your, with your career. And I suppose what I'm really interested about is that in that time as a professional footballer, you played for a number of clubs and you would have seen, you know, I know it was very old school and we are, I would love to have a chat about Eddie Howe and we'll do that further into the conversation. But even in those days, you played under a variety of different personalities, managers, leadership styles, ways of motivating players and perhaps demotivating players at the same time. I mean, what have you taken from those experiences into life? Some of the positive and some of the negatives or, or is that all behind you now? No, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, a good point. And, and I was lucky from the start. I worked with Steve Coppel at Palace from a distance because mm. he was the first team manager. But back in those days, even at 15, I was training with the first team at times, you know, as a young apprentice you know, they might have three goals or they have a shooting goal, so I'd be pulled across from the youth team. You know, I was very fortunate in my time at Palace to have a, a lot of um, interaction with the first mm -hmm. team players and the first team, clean their boots for, for, for one thing. Um, but also from a training point of view, and a, Steve Coppel to me was a, was a fantastic manager. He, he wasn't, he was, a, he was an introvert in many ways, yeah. but when he said something, it mattered. Right. He was Keep a very listening. intelligent man, yeah. Um, and I love working with Steve. Unfortunately, my time at Palace, and, and I, I picked up a, an injury. I, I, I played in the youth team, not the first year because I had an August birthday, which meant I had three, kind of three seasons in the youth team. And, um, and my first year, a young, another young keeper called Andy Woodman, who's now the Bromley manager, um, he played. But then that meant that I went out on loan to Dulwich Hamlet at 16. Right. You know, I was playing uh, Isthmian Premier League at 16. Yeah. Um, which was obviously a proper men's, higher, proper football. men's football. Yeah. <laughs> it was a higher standard and a harder standard than the youth team. Yeah. But I went to Dudley Chamlet for half the season. Um, I wouldn't say I was spectacular there, but it did teach me a lot about how to be strong in a yeah. game, um, physically, verbally. Um, my, my, my ability carried me through. I suppose on top of a mental strength, but my ability carried me through. And that was a great learning curve because the season after I was in the youth team. Mm. And then my last year in the youth team, we ended up winning the South West Counties, sorry, South East County Division 2 and then it was the FA Youth Cup final against, against a team of 92. So I played in that final yeah, against Man okay. United. Um, so, so my time in the youth team at Palace was excellent and, yeah. and really good. Now the training facilities were horrendous, you know, that side of it was poor. We didn't really have a goalie coach. Peter Bonetti coming occasionally to do a bit of coaching, but but we had a youth team manager in in Alan Smith, um, not the Arsenal centre forward, the, 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 the old Fulham manager, who he he he'd broke his leg when he was a young footballer. And he went off and made a successful business in sportswear, 
But the beauty of Alan was he loved the holiday. So in the youth team at Palace, we went everywhere. We went Spain, France, Portugal, Italy, <laughs> Germany. We had more trips in the first team, you know. And, and so my youth career at Palace was, was I was very, very fortunate. Yeah. The problem I had at Palace was that they signed after they got beat 9-0 at Anfield, which is, seems to be a common thread because I was at Bournemouth when they got beat 9-0 at Anfield. <laughs> so at that point, I stepped away yeah. thinking I was a Jonah. Um, they signed um, Nigel Martin from, from Bristol Rovers, first million pound goalkeeper. Yeah. And Nigel Remember Martin that. was just uh, exceptional. He was an exceptional goalkeeper. Mm. So my pathway into the Palace first team come just, to yeah, yeah. just stopped. I'd picked up an injury in my last year in the youth team as well. I fractured both my scaphoids, which ultimately meant I didn't play for 20 months. So that's a bone in your hand, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's quite a common goalkeeper injury, but breaking them both four months apart is, quite, is very uncommon. And they didn't pick it up to start with, so my last year I finished kind of with... Uh, the FA Youth Cup game, I finished with two broken wrists and a broken finger at Old Trafford, so that's quite an interesting story. <laughs> that's a claim to fame of sorts. It is, but then I didn't play for about 20 months, got back fit again, got number two in the Premier League behind Nigel. Yeah. Um, things were looking good for me and then tore a cartilage and didn't play for four months. Um, my Palace career, unfortunately, just got hindered by injuries in the end. Yeah. And Nigel to a degree, but I would have been quite happy at 21 to have been sat behind him for, yeah. a, for a period. Watching, learning. Yeah, essentially, yeah, because again, he was an exceptional character and goalkeeper. So when I got fit again and they had had to bring in a more experienced number two, you know, I found myself down the pecking order and I asked to leave. And at this point, um, Dave Bassett was a manager. Um, nothing against Dave. I just, I went in one day, I think the second day after he arrived and just said, look, Dave, nothing against you, but I need to play football. And, I, and, uh, and literally a day after that, I was, I was driving down to Bournemouth. Okay. Literally, um, they'd obviously shown interest in me, and, and, and that took me down to Bournemouth. In, in at the time, it was the, uh, I suppose it was the third division. Yeah. Um, and then that teleported me into a whole new world of football. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I like to refer to it as, as, it's like going to from, um, I suppose going from London City to the old Wild West. Yeah. You know, where it was just, you had three training balls and, and Mel Machin as a manager was a very interesting character for anyone that ever remembers Mel. And it was, uh, but I went there to play. Yeah, and just I, want to get back. I, well, I wanted to play league play football. football. I wanted yeah. to play league football. You get to a point, I was probably 22, 23, okay. where you just have to play league football. Yeah. Um, that certainly is a goalkeeper. And that's what brought me to Bournemouth. And, and you did, 90-odd appearances, wasn't it? Yeah, I think in the league, I think I think 99 maybe in the league, obviously cup games as well. And and even though I, I from very early on, Mel and me were going to clash. Yeah. Because I, I wasn't the easiest person to manage as well because I was quite emotional and I didn't like unfairness or, or my perception of okay. unfairness. So if, if a goal would go in and I didn't think it was my fault, and, and I could have been wrong at times as well. But openly now, when you look back at your, your kind of your arguments you've had, you know, Mel. For f but funny story, Ian Andrews, who was the goalkeeper before I I signed, uh, quite a famous goalkeeper. Ian Andrews played for Celtic mm -hmm. and, and um, Southampton. His wife was unfortunately poorly, so he was having to step away from football. But I had one training session with him down at Chapel Gate. I think the day I arrived. And afterwards, I remember we were in the car park and he, he shook my hand and said, oh, I wish you all the best, Jimmy. Uh, you know, they're a good bunch of lads. Obviously, the old cliches. Um, he said, I will tell you one thing. And he was talking about Mel Mage and he went, he hates goalkeepers. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, it fills you with confidence. It does, it? you know, here we go. We're now, you know. But, and that was probably, you know, my relationship with Mel was, was, was fractious, really. So, but... I played a lot of games with Bournemouth and I, lo I love Bournemouth mm. as a town. I never thought I'd leave London. You never do when you grow up really in London. You don't think the world exists outside London. But Bournemouth as a town was fantastic. A couple of lads followed me down from Palace, Ian Cox, Jamie Vincent. Yeah. Um, I lived with Jamie, you know. Um, he, he sadly passed, um, I think, last year. But um, it was some great times at Bournemouth. Yeah. And we... And, Big characters like Fletch, mate Holland was a captain, Steve Robinson, Steve Jones, you know, 
it, it was a funny place because the old Dean Court, anyone remembers it? Yeah, it's called to Chad, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was <laughs> you know, you had to, you used to see people like save their energy sometimes in games to try and run off the pitch quick enough to get into the shower first just to get some hot water, you know? So it was a very different place to the Vitality Stadium now. But it did have some momentum, didn't it? Because you had all those young players. There was a spell where they were signing young players from the Premier League and the Championship and bring them to the club and trying to make something happen. I well, Mel had a fantastic... Mel was very renowned in the game. Mm. He played football. He was very close with friends with Alex Ferguson. Um, so he had some great contacts and he would be able to get young players in to the club. So although Bournemouth never really succeeded in yeah. any way, I suppose the, the, the ultimate achievement was... He, was the, 1998 or windscreen final yeah. at Wembley. Although it never really achieved any ways, a lot of good young players come through yeah. Bournemouth. If you think of, I mean, even the ones, you think of Rio Ferdinand who come in on yeah. loan. Obviously, Jermaine Defoe. Um, you know, it's, there were really good players coming yeah. into the Bournemouth setup, and, and it, was a, it was a good time to play for Bournemouth. Yeah. And clearly, career then moved on. You left Bournemouth, you ended up at Swindon Town. I probably think it's probably about time we did discuss that goal <laughs> so um, I, it was only recently that I learned you weren't at Carl that season for long were you so for our listeners perhaps I'll leave it to you Jimmy to tell the story well I, I left I left but I knew uh, I signed two and a half year contract for Bournemouth and after about probably two months of dealing with Mel I knew I probably wouldn't sign another one uh, either by choice or you mm. probably wouldn't want me to so I was then left in the summer without contract and it kind of drew, summer was dragging on a bit and then um, I think it's the summer of this is the summer of probably 98, I think, after the windscreen final. And then Swindon Town come in for me and they offered me a four-year deal. Now, Swindon mm-hmm. were a championship side equivalent at the time. Steve McMahon was a manager. And I thought, well, yeah, wonderful. And, and I went to see Steve and he said, look, I, I've been keeping tabs in the Bournemouth, really impressed, you know, we want you to sign. So I went to Swindon really hopeful um, and... And straight from the start, it just didn't kick in for me, really. I thought I was going to play. I played a lot of the pre-season games. Did well, I thought. I don't think I could think. I think I could see one goal. But then Steve had other plans. He had another keeper there, Frank Talia, that he'd been injured the season before. And he wanted to play Frank at the start of the season. And, and it kind of knocked me back a little bit. Because, like I say, we'd finished Bournemouth. Had, had all the troubles off the pitch mm. at the time for Bournemouth. We were quite successful in the end on the pitch. So I was looking forward to kind of making a step up. It didn't quite work for me to start with at Swindon. And that, and that continued really at Swindon. Mm. And then Steve eventually got sacked and then Jimmy Quinn come in. I thought there'd be a good connection because of the Bournemouth connection with Jimmy Quinn. Phenomenal centre forward, Jimmy Quinn. One of the best centre forwards, probably old British type forwards you'd have got. But as, from a managerial point of view, he just, he, he, I wasn't, I didn't really... Um, well, I'm going to try and be polite here. He probably wasn't as good as he was a centre forward. As a <laughs> put it that way. So it just didn't work out for me. And then, and then towards the end of the 98-99 um, season, we had about three weeks to go. Yeah. It'd been a horrendous season for me. I'd got in a t- team at times and then got injured or, or the team was poor. They were struggling in the league. It just wasn't working out. And it was, I think it was a Tuesday, about three weeks to go. And basically he called me in his office and he said, look, Carl O have come in for you to go on loan. And I said, well, it's after the deadline. He went, yeah, they've got special permission to take you on loan. Do you want to go? And my initial reaction was, yeah, I want to go. Okay. I just want to go and play football. Because that's all I wanted to do, just go and play football. Send me up north here, okay. Well, you know, I, mean, I knew Carlisle where it was because <laughs> I've been there for Bournemouth and we'd, okay. had, we'd gone there on the bus once and got thumped 4-0 and, and what a horrendous journey back that is when you get thumped yeah. 4-0 at Carlisle. So eight hours back. We then went the previous season... Um, with Bournemouth when we were on a high end, we, we actually flew up at the time. We, we, I think, I think the club had chartered a plane and some fans paid for tickets, and we flew up and beat them one 0 and flew back down. We was in the we was in the nightclub. Sounds by like about, the glory days. It was. <laughs> we were in a nightclub by about ten o'clock. It was unbelievable. Um, that was the only time we ever flew anywhere with Bournemouth in those days. Trust me. So I. I basically got back in my car and I drove to London. I had to go to London to get some bits because I was yeah. going in between Swindon and London and Bournemouth at the time where my girlfriend lived at the time. Um, I was kind of doing a triangle during the right. week. 
So I was driving back to London, phoned my dad and said, look, dad, I'm going to Carlisle on loan. He went, oh, okay, son. Anyway, put the phone down, carry on driving down the M4. He phones me back. He says, you do realise where they are, don't you? I went, yeah, they're up north. He went, no. <laughs> he said, you realise that they're at the bottom of the fourth yeah. division or third division at the time um, in a relegation battle with, with Scarborough. I went, no, I didn't realise that. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, I've, I've now catapulted myself without thinking because I, I, I love football as a game and I love playing it. Mm. But I didn't really follow the tables. I didn't really know what yeah. team was where. I, I wouldn't say I'm a, a passionate lover of football, all the tactical, technical, statistical elements of yeah. it. I just love the I just love the game and I love the two boxes. You yeah. know, in in all honest, my psyche was just in it for the glory. You know, I needed the glory. I suppose that was that was okay. why. It's the adrenaline and yeah, the it was kind of... yeah, and I don't mind saying that because there are many reasons people are in yeah, football yeah. or play sport glory is not a bad one no. obviously it does leave you a bit short when you don't when you get, don't always get achieve glory, but, yeah. <laughs> but you know it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a bad thing to search after some sometimes so i um i had no idea and, and i just went okay fine and i just i wanted to play football yeah and basically that afternoon um nigel pearson called me it was his first job in football as a manager um, he called me in a very short conversation. He said, look, um, are you up for it, son? I went, yep. He went, right, you'll do for me. And it was that. He said, I'll see you up here tomorrow. Um, so I basically got in my car from London, drove to Carlisle, stayed overnight. Next day, um, so the next day I drove up. So it was, I was going to see him on, on, the, on the Thursday. So I was in for training on Thursday. And essentially, I'm, I've catapulted myself into a, a very big old football club yeah. that have been in the league for 71 years. You know, sleeping giant in some ways, Carlisle were at the time. Mm. And I've catapulted myself into probably their toughest, you know, yeah. time in their it's history. Battle for survival. Yeah, essentially. And half the squad, or probably more than half the squad, were Cumbrians, you yeah. know, young lads. Um, again, Nigel's first role in football, and, and I've catapulted myself into that. Now, my character is to go in all bullshit, or my perceived character, the one I created, Jimmy Glass yeah. character, is to go in all bullshit, and, and not cocky is the wrong word, but no. try and be a bit louder. And Let's pause there a minute. How different is the real Jimmy Glass to that persona? <laughs> I, um, I'm quite a sensitive character. That, that's what I'll say. I'm quite a sense. I'm quite an emotional character. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I don't know, the, the, the emotions that I had from a young man, I struggled with, and, and, mm. and I picked up a gambling habit towards the end of my, okay. my, well, actually, funny enough, when I was at Bournemouth, the old Royal Bath Casino, the Grosvenor there, I, I went in there one night, turned £40 into 104 well, this is good, this isn't is it? it? This is what I can do. This, is, this, is, this ain't bad. And, and it's, it plagued me for, for, for many years. Um, but that, and I'm not going to go too deep into yeah. addictions, because because we can call it an addiction if you like, but I th but for me it's a little bit more, there's more to it than that. You know, addictions feed on emotions. Yeah. And I'm not going to say weak mentality because it's not quite that no. simple, but they feed on emotions. And my understanding now, and it took me many years and a lot of looking at myself and understanding myself, and I went to GA and, and went dealt with a psychologist at times, but my understanding of life now is that basically when people have addictions, they're symptoms for, for a bigger problem. Mm. And if you want to beat the addiction, you have to beat the problem. Yeah. And it, you need to face it down. Yeah, you have to, you have to look it in the eye and, and that takes some doing. And, and sometimes you can only do that when you hit rock bottom. Um, and if you've got a shed load of money and you never really hit rock bottom, it's very hard to overcome. But yeah. when, you, when your football career falls apart and... You find yourself, you know, driving a taxi, and there's nothing wrong with driving a taxi, by the way. But you find yourself driving, so you have to, you have to look at your life yeah. and work out. That's when the strength of character needs to kick in. Doesn't well, it? then you, you, when you look at yourself, you start to understand yourself, mm. and you have to dig deep, and you have to, have to understand your reasons and your and your triggers and, and why you do things the way you do. And and I spent quite, a, I spent a whole decade doing that essentially while yeah. I drive my taxi. Um, and I, I'd never shy away from talking about it because I think it's an important element because mental health is an important element of modern times. Um, and, and the reality was I learned a lot about myself yeah. and, and probably my failings, why I didn't fulfill my football career, yeah. why I didn't fulfill my potential. 
But, but then going back to this character, that's why I created a character, because my emotions were yeah. quite fraught deep it's down. So this facade came out. Yeah, and this post. facade come, came out. And, and as I'm now older, and you ask who the real Jimmy Glass is, I, I'm deep down, I'm, I kind of, I'm probably a more calmer character yeah. than what you see if you're up in the hospitality rooms and yeah. I'm trying to make people laugh. Because yeah, yeah. all I'm actually trying to do in those rooms, and what I did with hospitality at Bournemouth, was I wanted to, I wanted to bring the changing room to the, to the yeah, hospitality so. side. Because when people come to football, football ultimately at the end of the day is, is entertainment. Yeah. Now it's a business. Yeah. But, but it's an entertainment but it's, business. But it's it? an entertainment business. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, on the pitch, it's about success at the highest level. It's about winning. But also, once you get that right, it's about how you win. Yeah. And, and I wanted to, my first experience at the hospitality of Bournemouth, although it was much, 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 much better than what it was when I was a player, was that it was a bit starchy still. Mm. And people would come and pay a lot of money to then get this, come into this football environment and be entertained. But that doesn't mean you can't be entertained while you're eating your roast chicken. No. You know, and, and what you find and what I find is, is and the reason I do these things is because I can. I just, I, I'm quite an emotional character and you yeah. just pick up the emotions in a room and you just feed off it. them. Well, and you manage them. Yeah, yeah. And that's what people want. People want to be entertained. Definitely. And there are people that sometimes can stand up and take the, take the reins and go okay well let's, let's have some fun but clearly Jimmy that's sat in front of me now has learned how to switch on that personality that bit of persona and live day to day with who you really are well there's another side of me now that's I do that because I can but there's a side of me that wants to be successful um, personally and, and after eight years at AFC Bournemouth watching Eddie very close and and seeing a transformation of a football club mm. from afar initially when I was driving my taxi looking go, oh, Eddie Howe's got a job. Oh, look, Eddie Howe's kept him up. And I remember Ed. I, know, I remember him as a young lad. I knew it was like as a character. And you think, how's he doing that? That's not Ed's character. But it was Ed's character because Ed basically was, was um, a driven individual mm. who aspired to be a better version of himself yeah. always. And that, and without giving away Ed's success and his, his secret too much, that's what Ed does. That's his secret sauce. It is. He, Ed wants to. Ed doesn't sit back on his laurels. He wants to be the best version of himself. Yeah. And in order for him to do that, yeah. he needs to inspire everyone around him to do that. And sometimes you do that with a, with a fist, and sometimes you do that with a yeah. a kind and word. It, and then I'm you know, fortunate probably only to have a couple of decent kind of conversations with Eddie and. Mm. That was probably one of the things that I took away is he does want to be the best version of himself and he's always listening to see how he can improve. But he installed that well, he didn't attitude it, throughout the club, didn't he? he wanted well, the everybody thing is, if you club. want to succeed, if you want to succeed, and this, this is really important to Ed, he needed people around him who wanted, to, who wanted to be the best version of themselves as much as he wanted them to be the best yeah. version of themselves. Yeah. So with players, there's nothing more frustrating to Ed than someone not wanting to work as hard as he yeah. he wanted them to work on. Or, or knew they would be frustration and anger Yeah, point because thing. he would see, as a coach, his main skill is a coach on the pitch. You know, he's, a, he's a football coach and he can make players better. Mm -hmm. And that's what he does. That's, why he's, that's what he did at AFC Bournemouth. That's why he had the success he had. The team that went up the first time was a very strong mentally mm -hmm. team. There, there were partnerships all over the pitch. And then he's done the same at Newcastle. You know, he's gone and took a team of talented players and just made them better. Um, it's, it's a, that's a very simplistic yeah. version <laughs> yeah. of what he's done. Yeah. But in essence, it's the truth about him. And, and that's, again, it's that, it was that desire to get involved with that that, that brought me back into football because I was so far removed from yeah. it. And then when I came back into football, I knew that I would have to aspire to be the best version of myself and I wouldn't make the same mistakes I made the first time around. So therefore, the opportunity I first had was to go in the lounge. Yeah. So I was going to go into the lounge and, and literally set it on fire if I could because I wanted to make this sure that... It. And I understood what Ed was trying to achieve. So I tried to implement what he was trying to do everywhere I could around mm. the club. And then after a year, and then I went in as player liaison. And then after a year, I think Ed recognised that I got him. And, I, and he kind of set me loose on the rest of the yeah. club. 
Because you'd been on that long journey yourself, hadn't you? So you probably did have empathy with who he was and well, what I he was to what achieve. He was trying because to you'd do. been on that journey yeah, I that 13 what he was years doing. out of football. Yeah, yeah, I recognised what he was doing, essentially. He, he realised, and when you take a club like AFC Bournemouth, yeah. that for, for decades, a century pretty much, had never really achieved anything. Sorry, no. damn it. sorry, Harry. I know you took my championship, and that's yeah. obviously that, there's that, that, moments. But, it was but I'm talking about hundred years of existing. Yeah, wasn't I'm it, talking really? about a club. You know, uh, a, a club in itself becoming a Premier League. The, 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 the thought AFC Bournemouth could ever become, yeah. to be fair, a solid Championship team, yeah. was unbelievable. And then suddenly they're moving up the Championship, and they could have been the playoffs the first year and then yeah. suddenly the second year they're, they're, they're hammering the league and they yeah. win the championship and then they go into the Premier League and then they they stay up which is like phenomenal achievement and then the next season they finish not it's just that it's it is a magical and listen lots of people have told this story and, it, and it's everyone knows about the Bournemouth story and it's a magical story full of, full of great characters yeah. great characters you know, Big and Fletch, you know, you've got, you got Neil Blake in there, you've got Maxime, you've got Jeff Mostyn. Great characters mm. are part of that journey. But ultimately, it was Ed's drive. Yeah. His desire to be the best version of himself and then implement that on whatever team represented him, the staff that represented him. Everyone had to, had to tune into that mindset and that mentality. And I wanted to be part of that because that's all them years in the taxi, that's what I realised. That's I what you were working towards, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, basically. So um, I think I think you asked me about the goal and I've gone off on a tangent. Yeah, no, it's but, a good uh, tangent to have gone on, Jimmy. But we should probably go back to that goal. So this so, is your third game, isn't so it? So basically, I'm, I'm at Carlisle. We're now two games into my loan spell. Um, Scarborough had started to have a little winning run. We're down to the last game of the season. We had two draws. We drew with Darlington at home. I can see the three goals. Didn't play particularly brilliant. It wasn't horrendous, but mix up with a defender for one of them. Went to Hartlepool, kept a clean sheet, nil-nil. Um, my memories are of that game that cause it was one of Peter Beardsley's last games as a footballer, and I remember he met a free kick, and I flipped it out of the top corner. <laughs> so that was quite a nice. One of those moment. memories, to yeah, just you. something you know that, that you think about over the years um, when you hear his name. But then we came down to the last game of the season, and it's at home, Brunton Park. It was the eighth of May, nineteen ninety nine. I remember the sun was shining; it was blue skies. Um, but. Being in Carlisle for the, the weeks commencing and I'd come back after the game and go back up on a Wednesday um, of the previous games and then do some training for a couple of days. Stayed in, um, stayed in the hotel up by the M6. But my memories were that this massive club with all these fans, and they they'd get good fans. There was over 10,000 in the ground um, for the last game of the season. I think officially they said eight, but there wasn't. There was yeah. m- many more. Um, the whole town was resigned because <laughs> Carlisle were now bottom of the league. If Scarborough would have won, that Carlisle would have anyway. relegated. That's 71 years of Football League history. But there was a bigger thing at play because the, the chairman at the time, Michael Knighton, um, remembered for juggling the ball up in front of Stretford End when he <laughs> tried to buy Man United. And they transpired he didn't have the money, but he, he, he did dress up in a full Man United kit. <laughs> he was an interesting character. Again, one of the many interesting characters yeah. I've come across over the years. But the fans truly believed because they'd released their profits for the season or the year profits had been released just before that and it was like £1.3 million profit. I think they were like the fourth in biggest... In 1999. They were the, fourth, well, they were the fourth biggest profit or the fourth most profit of any football club in the country wow. that, that year. And they're bottom of the league. And they're bottom of the, the bottom league, the bottom of the third division. And he'd sold pretty much all the talent um, during the last six months. And many fans believed, and this is just a belief, I'm not saying it's true or false, that he wanted to, he wanted the club to get relegated. He wanted to merge in with Barrett Rangers and take them into the Scottish League so that he could then... Yeah, build a super club in Scotland. Build a, yeah, I mean, it was it's reasonably easy to get up into the Scottish Premier League at the time mm. with a bit of money. So the fans were, were basically could see the end of their football club. And he had death threats and, you know, all sorts from the fans. He asked for police protection on the final day, which they refused. <laughs> which is quite, quite interesting. Um, so all that was surrounding the game as well. So on one hand, we had this, this game of football with this young squad, Nigel Pearson, young manager, um, a goalkeeper on loan from Swindon. You know, um, 
it was all kind of building into this real emotional kind of um, finale. And then the, this Carlo won a great team. They've been struggling. They had some nice lads, good players, you know, in terms of characters, but they weren't a great team. And we were playing Plymouth Argyle. goal. They had nothing to play for. Um, and the, the game, in all honesty, in some ways, was a kind of a, a dull affair. Carlo had a go to, yeah. it, by the way they could, but, you know, went 1 0 down to Lee Phillips, um, you know, ran from inside his own half and threw about six players and slightly in the bottom corner, which kind of summed up. Carlo was a team probably to a certain degree that wouldn't sound too harsh and then they, we get a goal back through the captain David Brightwell and it's 1-1 it's I've got to say Brights it was a great goal it was much better than mine as well as <laughs> it was the most important goal on the day yes I know um, so he puts one in from about 25 yards which is great for you from your left side of centre half so um, it came down essentially to the the game was over. It's one-one. Mm -hmm. the, the guy on the tannoy, a guy called Colin Carr, was going crazy down the tannoy, which I'm sure the FA frowned upon. But he was trying to. The game over in Scarborough had finished. They were five minutes behind. We were five minutes behind them because because um, one of the one of the Plymouth players, uh, Gibbo, had broke his leg at just before half time. So we were five minutes behind. So it came down to the fact that the, the Scarborough game had finished one-one. They were playing Peterborough which meant the way the points worked out that if we had scored and won the game, we would have, we would have stayed up. Um, and it was down to this last five minutes. And I, I don't, it's funny because over the years, you kind of, you see the situation unfold on the TV more than you yeah. remember it. But I just remember the crowd were just united, 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 10,000 people shouting, screaming, but, but this air of, um, acceptance that probably they're about to get relegated yeah. but they're still shouting United United and and it all came down essentially to the, the last kick the last corner and um, and afterwards David Brightwell told us that you know when he was running up he said to the ref how long and he said this is it right last kick of the game basically, basically. yeah and, and, and I remember I pumped a ball forward and it ricocheted off a couple of people went out for a corner Scott Doby took the corner and I'm I'm looking across, thinking because over the years I'm, I'm a frustrated centre forward. I've, I've never hidden that. <laughs> the day before in training, I scored a hat trick um, running around in the five of sides. I didn't put my gloves on. I don't think once. Maybe we did the set pieces. Um, so I've always been a frustrated centre forward. But the truth of the matter is, I'm not a frustrated centre forward. I'm actually a centre forward <laughs> <laughs> who played professionally as a goalkeeper. You know, who played professionally as a goalkeeper. But I'm actually a centre forward, and that. And the reason I say that is because. And this is going to sound crazy. The only time I was ever truly confident on a football pitch, truly confident, was when I played on pitch, when I played up front. Wow. As a goalkeeper, I, I was always nervous, although I hit it well at times, probably not so well other times. But the only time I was actually truly confident and probably happy was when I was playing on pitch. For, for whatever reason, I just had this belief that I could just score goals. And they, they could be 30 yards or a two-yard tap yeah. in or... I just had this, and whether it's because I played for many years in goal and you understand what beats you or whether, I, I'm not sure what it was. And people laugh at me when I say it, but I generally... Goalkeeper that can play with his feet, you'd, make, you'd have made it in the modern well, game. Well, that's <laughs> just a whole new irony. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who wants to earn 100 grand a week anyway? But, um, but I do, I just felt I had this yeah. ability to score goals. And whenever I walked onto a football pitch, even as a goalkeeper, I just had the belief I'd would score or I'd try to score. I remember trying to, we had a free kick once at Bournemouth in the middle of our own half and I used to kick a ball quite well. I remember literally just m missing, beating Chris Woods when we played Burnley. Like, it literally just went past the top corner where I saw him off his line. And I remember Willow told me, Mel Machin turned around to Willow, oh, did he just shoot them, Willow? Did he just shoot them? Like, <laughs> desperate to, and Willow's like, no, no, I don't think he did, no. <laughs> no, he didn't get for Um, Sorry about my Mel Machin impression. <laughs> and so basically it came down to this last, this last 10 seconds. So I, I started to run up the pitch. Again, the, probably the nervous part of me looked across at the manager for permission. And I think that kind of summed up my character in some ways. Yeah. You know, I think I was Slightly always... unsure of himself. I was always a little bit unsure. Yeah, and Nigel Pearson's just waving me up. 
things like that, you might as well. Go, go. well <laughs> in his own words, he says, you might as well go on. You might as well, son. Um, and then I suppose instinct takes over and, and the corner comes in. And all I know is whenever I dropped a cross or a corner in a six-yard box, there was someone there to tap it in and mm. make me look stupid. So my understanding of the two boxes, like I've said, is, you know, all the action happens in, in certain places. So I just headed for the centre of the six-yard box and, and the corner come in. Scott Doby had a great, powerful header at the near post, but straight at the keeper. But as I arrived in the, like, across the penalty spot, I just saw the six-yard box just open up, literally just open up, and there was no one in it. <clears throat> and James Dungy, the keeper, just kind of parried it. Um, and it just fell to me. And I literally, I just arrived in the six-yard box on my own. Um, it just fell to my right foot, six yards out. Then I just volleyed it in the bottom corner. I'd always like to joke it'd still be rolling now if it ended up but uh and you know that 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 moment was just um listen for the ten thousand Carlisle fans and the hundred thousand in the town it was it was a a phenomenal moment in their history and, and they they remember it fondly for football mm -hmm. it was a fond moment i think people yeah. that it really it's one of those that gets replayed even now it, doesn't it well it just it kind of throws up the romance of the game yeah. and what how special this game is and why it's so special you know, ultimately, it's, the goal isn't about me. I, I was just part of it. Yeah. And Neddy always asks when I say this, you know, it's football's goal. <clears throat> um, and that's why it's lived. And I was just, I was a part of, of it. I think the crazy thing is, and the irony, as I look back over the years, and again, I've said this before, and people sort of tutter me up, but I, I probably didn't deserve a fantastic football career because although I love football, I didn't put enough work in or effort. I wasn't in charge of my, or managed my mindset that well. Um, and I, I, you know, I, years later, I realised that. You know, I, I, instead of looking for people to help me become a footballer, I should have just done it myself and found a way forward, yeah. found a way to be the best version of myself. And I suppose in that period of football, there were certain players that started to do that, didn't they? Yeah, Gareth I think Southgate so. Gareth of this world. The... Yeah, you just because you had to, ultimately. If, if there someone's... was nobody else going to do it for you. No, you have to do it yourself. You can find all the excuses in the world why to fail. There's loads mm. of them. But, but can you find the, the, the desire and the, the, the mental strength to succeed? That's the, that's the hard bit. But it's achievable if you understand it. And I think... Looking back over my career, again, this is all a little bit romantic, and and I'm not a great believer in fate. I'm not, I'm not a spiritual person, but I love football, and I did put in a good shift at times, and I tried hard when I was a young footballer, and I I come up against injuries, and I come up against setbacks, and I kept going. I come up against dodgy managers, and I kept going, and I kept going just for the love of the game, and to try and just to try and succeed, and try and get that glory, I suppose. So I think what football did in the end, it didn't give me a career. It didn't give me 500 league games in the international career, but it gave me a moment. Yeah. And and the irony is, from someone that spent his whole life not knowing if he was a goalkeeper or a centre forward, the <laughs> irony is it gave me a moment as a goalkeeper being a, scoring a goal. Yeah. You know, so it was it was a it, it was a phenomenal moment in my life. I've had some ups and downs, many ups and downs, if I'm honest, and and uh, still do, but. It was a phenomenal moment that I'm, that I'm eternally grateful for. Yeah, I was going to say, how, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was how you felt, but I think you've answered it really. How did you feel like that small moment of fame has defined you as an individual? Does it ever frustrate you that that's your, you know, that's the defined moment Jimmy Glass well, is a well, professional Well, it did. Football? Yeah, I mean, it did. When I was struggling, my years of struggling, you know, soon after that, I found myself out of a contract and I couldn't work out. I'm suddenly, from, from the back pages of every sporting paper in the world to not being able to get a game or yeah. not being able to get a contract for many years sat in my taxi in the early days when I was struggling with my gambling and young family and trying yeah. to survive in the real world without any what I felt at the time real skills although again that was a mindset thing because I clearly did but had no self-belief or self-confidence my career had disintegrated in front of me from a moment of elation mm. and, and yeah. unbelievable yes. fame to literally two years later I'm trying I'm you know, I'm going to the the 
I think I went to a um, what do you call it a uh, an employment company um, in Bournemouth, and she said, "Well, we got you can do some box packing in a, in a warehouse, you know." <laughs> I then went to work Spire Technology in Verwood for some guys and they kind of got me into the working world and, yeah. you know, good friends, some of them still. Um, but ultimately, I, you know, I, I didn't achieve what I wanted to achieve as a footballer. And that was purely because of my mindset. It wasn't because of ability. I know that for a fact. Because when I went back to Bournemouth in the last eight years, I, I was training up until about two years ago still, yeah. diving around and training with the first team with Ed. And actually probably a better goalkeeper because of like to Neil Moss mm. and Gareth Stewart and people I've then worked with, you know, <laughs> it's ridiculous when you think about it. First time I'm, <laughs> I'm 45 and the first time I'm getting any goalkeeping coaching, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, it, this is my. I think for many years I felt the goal was an albatross. Yeah. Because it, it turned me into a bit of a circus. Yeah. It turned Jimmy wherever Glass into... You, wherever a, you went. It, yeah, it was a bit of a circus. Even after I scored for a couple of years, I was trying to find a club, trying to find a game, but you just up against, go on, Jimmy, run up the pitch, go on. Every change you yeah. walk into, you Jimmy Glass. Oh, you've got to score again. Yeah, it kind of detracted. But then I think, if I'm truly honest, my career was on the way down before I scored the yeah. goal. So like I said before, I'm, I'm eternally grateful. If, if football felt I deserved the moment, it certainly gave me more. Definitely, definitely. And it, couple of questions just to start to round up our conversation I'm going to talk about Wimbledon Town but if you could go back to that 15 year old signing a YTS contract to Crystal Palace with everything you've learned the journey that you've now been on what words of wisdom would you give what piece of advice would you give that 15 year old would you know what it's it's kind of every 15 year old really because this isn't really a football thing you know, only, uh, only allow people you truly respect and love to affect your emotions. Mm. Beautiful. You know? Love that. Because I'm not saying other people don't deserve to, but only, only allow people you respect and love to affect your emotions. Everyone else, just leave them to it. You know, be yourself, know yourself, and, and try to become the best version of yourself. And, and this... This isn't about football. This is just in general yeah, for everybody. It's about life. And if you know, you'd find people wouldn't be plagued with their emotional problems and their their addictions and things like that. If they, if, if someone at a young age took took a young, unsure boy or girl and, and just taught them that and could get that through to them. Yeah. Because if you manage your emotions and you manage your mindset, probably more importantly, well, no, as importantly, not more important because your emotions can really dictate your life if you let them. We can go. We can talk about the chimp paradox and things like that, you know. But ultimately, yeah. if you, for me, if you want to find a truth to to mindset and mentality, that's probably one of the best ones. It's a great book. Well, it does because it, it what, what it also shows your emotions are really, really, really important. Yeah, you know they're massively important. Yeah, you can't ignore them, can you? Well, you can't. And if you do ignore them, that's yeah, extremely dangerous. But they are to be managed. Yeah. In certain places, agreed. Let them loose. Yeah. Enjoy life. Love, passion, all these things are brilliant, yeah. but they are to be managed. And if you can manage your emotions, and not only my psychologist taught me this, and when I'd use the word control, he said, No, we don't control anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, no one wants to control anything, you want to manage them. Yeah. And, I, and initially, I didn't really understand that, but I was on a journey, and now I do. You manage everything. You know, if you can manage your emotions and therefore manage your self belief and, and not let things get to you that that don't deserve to get to you, then you've got a good chance. Brilliant. Thank you, Jimmy. Great advice. <laughs> I'm listening myself. Um, you're now at Wimbledon. We're sat in this fantastic facility. Obviously, games being kinder to you second time round, you made the most of the opportunity that presented itself. Uh, six months so ago, you took the decision to leave Bournemouth um, and come to Wimbledon as a general manager. What were the reasons behind that? It's a really, really difficult decision because I love Bournemouth. Mm. I love Bournemouth when I played there. I was really, really, really sad to leave. I love the, the area. And when I say Bournemouth, obviously I mean Paul, I mean Wimbledon. Yeah, the wider conservation. Just, and just the whole so. place. You know, again, I grew up in London, never thought I'd leave. You know, I, I can't imagine living anywhere else now. It's, it's, a, it's such a beautiful place to be. Um, 
So, but Bournemouth Football Club, what they achieved, and I got on that journey later when they got into the Premier League, but what they achieved with Ed and JT and Tinney, Simon Weatherstone, by the way, for anyone who don't know, uh, Stephen Purchase, Neil Moss, obviously Fletch, everyone else involved with the club, what they achieved for me was, was just a thing of beauty. You know, it, it, was, it was like a shining light in football for me. But in Ed's words, you know, at some point it was always going to come to an end because yeah. it's, you can't, it burnt Ed out, to be fair. It, yeah. it absorbed, it took so much of his yeah, ability yeah. and his mindset. He's been really honest about that, hasn't he? There's yeah. a great podcast, the High Performance yeah, Podcast, right. yeah. where he speaks really openly yeah. about it. It's a great listen. And do you know what the truth is? And I, I love Ed and I, I, I think he's phenomenal. But we could all see it. It was yeah. taking too much of him. Yeah. And because it did, because yeah. when you're when you're truly overachieving to the level what AFC Bournemouth had done at that point, yeah. um, and 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 what they did there was put in place the foundations for what you're now seeing AFC Bournemouth getting into the Premier League's one thing phenomenal achievement, staying there for five years, yeah. and then giving the club the opportunity to create yeah. the foundations. Now I I don't mean so much as the Obviously, the training pitch hadn't been built. The stadium's still not owned. But, but the club got a financial foundation. Yeah, and well, an ethos about it, didn't it? Yeah. And a belief, it, well, it, even you know, without him there. Yeah, it, it did. I think when it went down, it, it wobbled and it took its time to mm. establish itself. Um, but it was there. You know, when you fall out of the Premier League, you've got two seasons. Yeah. If you don't get back in those two seasons... The financial implications mean it's very, very, very different, yeah. difficult. Sorry to, 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 unless someone's going to put in a lot of money, which you can't always because of financial fair it, play yeah. and stuff like that. It's very difficult to, 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 to get yourself back up. And they did it on the second go. Um, and then obviously Gary O'Neill done a phenomenal job last year to keep them up with, with the help of Tommy and, and Coops. Um, and then the new lad, Ariella, stepped in. Um, and it was difficult to start the season. But yeah. but I think you're starting to see the foundations that were in place now. And you're starting to see... Um, well, the results are certainly coming, aren't they? And the style of play is coming. Yeah, it is. And you've got... I mean, I can't speak highly enough of, obviously, some of the players. Neto... What a phenomenal signing. And he's a good friend of mine and people are going to think this is a bit... But he's, a, he's, he's just a phenomenal character. I can't mm. tell you from a ment mentality point of view how lucky they are to have Neto as captain. And I know he had a wobble and the fans started to pick on him, but yeah. but ultimately it wasn't a wobble. It's just that that's what happens when results aren't going yeah. your way, that people start to look to come back playing with confidence, though, didn't it? Well, it just... proves probably a sense of resilience well, and mindset just, again, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But I don't think it's just... It's Neto, I think. It's it's, it's two centre-halves. It's Marcus and, yeah. and Ilya. You know, the, the whole team... You start to see Adam Smith back in the side. and yeah. The whole team's now started to... <clears throat> I mean, there's probably not much change behind yeah. the scenes, but suddenly you get that win and there's some real good quality players there. They've signed some really good quality players. So you, you get that win... You get a bit of confidence, sometimes a bit of luck here and there. Yeah, but let's, let's put no too fine a point in it. I mean, had they not conceded in the 90th minute against Aston Villa, they were a very good team. Yeah. Bournemouth would have won the last five games on the bounce in the Premier League. Yeah. Now, they've never it's, done that. It's unheard of, isn't As it? As brilliant as Ed was and is, even Ed never did that. No. You know, and, and the reasons, I mean, and again, you're not, you know, you're beating Man United, um, you're beating Newcastle. You know, obviously Sheffield United are struggling, but they go there and convincingly beat Sheffield United. You know, you, there's some there's some really good, solid performances going into that. And the club now, you're starting to see hopefully what the club is going to become. Yeah. Obviously, new 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 owners. Um, they're doing it very differently to yeah. the way it was before. Um, and that's fine. If you're going to come in and pump three, four hundred million into a football club, you should be able to do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, and I just think now they've got a belief with the manager and the, and the owners and it's starting to gel for them. And it's really great to see because I, I love Bournemouth. And so it was a really difficult decision at the start of the season for me to step away. But I think for me, I'd achieved everything I mm. could achieve at Bournemouth. You know, because I never coached, because I haven't got coaching badges and because yeah. probably the nature of who I am and my career, 
you know, I, I wanted to go in there and not run the football club, but be be an in, integral part in yeah. in how it how it was run. And with Eddie, I was to a degree. Yeah. You know, I was in charge of all logistics and where we went and how we got there and trips and players' yeah. lives. And so you're really making that contribution. Yeah, I was, and I was into the I was kind of Ed's voice in the community, Ed's voice in the the commercial department, yeah. Ed's voice connecting the media and stuff, you know. And that was what I wanted to do because I, I believed I could do that. I believed that I had that through my own um, experiences. Mm. I had that, I had something to put back into the club. When I left, that changed quite dramatically yeah. for me. Um, and and I've, I've not left on any, you know, I wish them all luck and not left under any sort of bad... Um, they can't move any of the guys. It was just time for me to step down. Yeah. And it, it came at a time when I was speaking to to uh, Martin Higgins from yeah. MSP Capital about some, something else completely, actually. Um, and I knew he'd been involved with Wimborne for a season and I've got a good friend here, Graham Bell, who's one of the directors of Wimborne that's supported the club for, for many years. And he kept telling me to come down and look what was happening. They've got this new ground, ground being built for them by... Wyatt Holmes, yeah. Davey wanted to build some big houses down by the river. And yeah. The council said, okay, you can do that, but you've got to build a stadium for the football club. It's been in the town since 1878, yeah. by the way. It's Wim- incredible. an it? old team. Yeah. So that's what he did. Um, and he built this fantastic, basic but fantastic stadium. Yeah, it's an incredible facility, isn't it? For an- it is. And in, 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 in the non-league circles, local non-league circles, we like to pull town. Obviously, they've done really well. They did really well under Tommy for, for, mm-hmm. for many years, but they were always limited by their ground. Yeah, they just kept hitting that ceiling, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, because you can't, you know, there's, there's other things you need. Because they would have had benefactors putting money in and, and you can yeah. get a certain level of benefactors. But, but what you need to be able to do as a football club, and, and this is them, I'll tell you how I got involved, but this is the ethos. I know as a football club, you've got to make money Monday to Friday. Yeah. You have to make money Monday to Friday as a football club. If you've got a benefactor, that should be a bonus. It, yeah. it can't be the whole ethos. That's the cream of, on the top. Yeah, it can't be the whole ethos of the club, how, how it's going to succeed. Um, so, so basically speaking, I came in here, I looked at the facilities, because Martin and I sat down, we were talking about something completely different, like I said. I told him about my time at Bournemouth. Mm. He told me about why he'd got involved with, with Wimborne Town, and I yeah. could see the passion in his eyes. Um, and I won't tell you too much about Martin, because he's quite a private person. Well, he's going to be a guest on the podcast in a few Is weeks. Is he? Fant- yeah. well, fantastic. You can ask him yourself. Yeah. But he's, he's, he's a very driven guy, yeah. a very smart guy. Amazing individual. You know, done really well for himself in a, in a, in a decent way. You know, there's nothing shady about a business. Yeah. Very solid business. Very well respected. Um, and he's just developed this passion for grassroots football, for non-league football. And he's got he's had a box at Bournemouth over yeah. the years. He's been shirt sponsors. He has he? been shirt sponsors. He's you been know, at that end of the game yeah. as well. And he could be anywhere in the world he wanted. Yeah. But he, he, he <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, he's at Cribs Away. <laughs> so watch us get beat, which wasn't great. But he goes everywhere. Yeah. He goes everywhere with his daughter. Um, and they go and watch Home and Away. And that's the passion that I love. Right. You know, if I know someone's at the helm but can't yeah. kind of on a day-to-day basis, and he would if he had a chart. If he, if he could, he'd be here every day trying to do yeah. something, you know. But he, he needed someone to step in and try and, I suppose, implement his visualisation of what yeah. he wanted Wimbledon sort of to be. kind of some of those ideas. Yeah, essentially. Bring some things to fruition. Yeah, and, and from our conversation, he realised that I felt the same way. Yeah. And... So this was an opportunity for me to, to <laughs> drop eight leagues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I always say, drop eight leagues, and a little shiver goes down. It's nearly spine. as dramatic as falling out of the game and becoming a taxi driver. Nearly, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, do, I do seem to travel the spectrum of, uh, of experiences. But basically, it's just such a phenomenal opportunity. Yeah. Now, I see Wimborne Town, I see what it is, and I see what it can become. One of the directors or and well a couple of directors were, were generous enough to build them a 3G training pitch literally next door to the anyone's not been to Wimborne has got a great main grass pitch um, which is well looked after by Steve Berry who also works at Bournemouth as well um, but they've got a full size 3G pitch next to it floodlit all of both of them obviously 
it's just a phenomenal facility. Now, when you've got those, when you've got those, um, that facility and you've got the opportunity, you've got to grab the ball and run with it. You literally got to take it as far as you can take it. Yeah. You know, you don't sit back and go, oh, we're doing all right. We look, we're much better than that club or much better. You literally got to go, how good, how good can we be? Yeah. Where can we go? Now, for me, it's not unreasonable, and there are lots of different things to overcome and lots of different ways, but it's not unreasonable to consider that this club in the next four or five years could be a sustainable, and that's the word sustainable, uh, National South Club. Yeah. At least. Wow. At least. And there's clubs that have done it like Dorking, isn't there? There are clubs that have done it, yeah. Yeah, and, and again, a roadmap towards it, I well, you can do it, like I say, there's two ways of doing it. You right. can do it with, via a, a benefactor. Yeah. But the problem with that is there's it's no... His sus- board. When he wants to take his board it away. Is. There's no sustainability no. to it. And Martin's not that character, but ultimately, you know... You've got the support of the character and you've got the infrastructure you to build a business around Basically. So what we're planning here at Wimborne Town is to create revenue streams Monday to Friday. Um, we've... We're, I won't give too much away, but we're we're going to try to develop the club so that we can offer the local community things they need, yeah. which will give us the money we need to become a sustainable National South Club. Brilliant. On top of that, our reserve team, um, and when I came here, and it's quite common in football, our reserve team and our first team were kind of disconnected because generally speaking, your managers come into non-league clubs like this and they'll just focus on the first team because that is essentially where the yeah. success has to be. But I, 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 w- I would like Wimborne Town and I think the board um, understand that I, I want them to be an old-style football club. I want a youth team, a reserve team and a first team yeah. like I grew up in. And there's a reason for that. And it's not always economically viable to certain clubs. And I get why the reserve teams have, have kind of fallen away. Yeah. But for me, to, I want, we need to create a pathway yeah. right away from our under sixes. And bear in mind, we have 34 youth teams at Wimborne Town. 34. 34 youth teams, which has, wow. I think, grown in the last four or five years from something like five. We have seven development squads. Um, we have an academy now of young 16 to 18 year olds doing their BTEC in sport um, course and training um, every day, playing matches. Next year we're going to take, we've got, I think we've got 15 at the moment, next year we're going to take on another 25. We'll have 40 young youngsters here every day doing their BTEC. Wow. So the plan is to create a pathway all the way through from under sixes yeah. to be, for me, to be the best club outside the Vitality by far. Brilliant. And then, and then, you'll see Wimborne be able to elevate itself into the national self. Now to that, make those steps. Yeah. Now you have to do things to, to create that. Like I say, you can throw a bucket of money out and take this club in national self, but there's no sustainability to it. And Martin understands that, um, and the board understand that. And it's really important that we've got a great board here of people that love the club. There's some people here that have put money into the club for years, kept mm-hmm. it alive, sustained it when it could have gone. And, and I'm glad now that they're seeing the, the fruits of their, their efforts as well. But the, t- the team's top of the league, the reserve team are top of the league as well at the moment, the DPL. Next year, we're going to push the reserve team into the Wessex League. Okay. So you'll have, my, the thoughts are in a couple of seasons' time, two or three seasons' time, you'll have a National South Club playing there and probably a Wessex Premier League team wow. playing there. So every Saturday, you could come to Wimborne Town um, and watch either a National South game or a, or a Wessex Prem game. And that's not even touching on the fact you can come watch the AFC Bournemouth Development Squad now at Wimborne Town, come and yeah, play there. Yeah, that connection's back. Well, it is, because one of the things I realised was that Bournemouth are building their training facility two miles up the road, their £50 million pound training facility. They've got, um, they've got big ideas, obviously, and big dreams for that. To have a National South team two miles away from yeah. the training ground makes a lot of sense. is a massive, <laughs> massive, massive yeah. plus for Bournemouth. But again, it's been a big change in your life. We've touched on that. What have you learned about yourself? Which is, we wrap up the conversation. Jimmy, what have you learned about yourself in the last six months? Um, <laughs> it's funny enough, you touched on it earlier, that my life seems to take this sort of, I wouldn't call it a roller coaster, but it, it yeah. goes off in different directions. I think one of the main strengths I have really is I'm not scared to create a new me. Yeah. Is to keep 
growing, hopefully. But that moment you step off the cliff to create a new you is a daunting moment, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. It's nervous. It's nerve-wracking. But, but you have to trust yourself. You have to trust your skill sets. When I was young, I didn't. No. I spent the last eight years in a very, very, very um, progressive growth mindset environment yeah. with Ed yeah. and all the boys at Bournemouth. And I realised that unless you actually have a go at life and you try to achieve, then you won't. And, and, and I'd like to try and bring that here to Wimborne Town because it's, it's got a phenomenal opportunity. There's phenomenal people here. Um, and I'm really excited about being part of it. Brilliant. Final question on the podcast that I always ask, and I think we've touched on this during the course of the conversation, but I am going to ask the question, what's your personal definition of success, Jimmy, with everything you've learned in life? Um, see, ultimately, when you get away from all the money and all the, the fame and, and, and all the different relationships you have in your life and the different loves and the... Ultimately, I think the, the, what success is, is contentment. It's waking up in the morning content with your life and, and not feeling like you're chasing something or you've lost something or, yeah. you know, you just wake up and you go, yeah, things are good. Brilliant. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for being so open, honest, being so self-aware and sharing some of those life experiences that you've had uh, with our listeners. Thank uh, you for being an incredible guest. Thank you. It's my pleasure.